Welcome, everybody. My name is David Vendette. I'm the senior pastor here at Rock City Church in Corpus Christi. Thank you so much for tuning into our live stream. My heart is to see you live in the fullness that God has for you and to be fired up all the days of your life. That comes from intimacy, spending time with the Lord, His Word, and growing in the knowledge and wisdom of who He is. And that's my heartbeat in every message that I preach. I hope you've enjoyed watching some of our worship. And also, while you wait, enjoy some of these short past clips from past messages that I've preached. I would encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube page and also like us on Instagram and Facebook and stay fired up and I'll see you in just a moment. Other signs of a poverty mentality, and this is a little convicting, a constant search for the cheapest alternative, an obsession with getting deals and free entry. I've never, if you, if you can only wear name brand and you have to have the most expensive purse, ladies, or the best jeans and shoes all the time, that's a sign of mammon being a God in your life. Now, I like wearing name brand things. Thank God for Marshalls and TJ Maxx. Thank God that Dillard's run sales. That's all I'm saying. But I'm not talking about buying little things or clothes. I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about there's times that God says, you pay full price for that car. You pay full price for that piece of land or that house. Christians are notorious for always trying to get the cheapest bargain free thing. Shouldn't we be the ones that set the standard? And the guy comes along and he offers a hard working construction guy or lawn mowing guy or moving guy or whoever it is you are comes along and you don't you don't have to chintz them down and nickel and dime. You say, how much is oh, 50 to mow my lawn? No problem. Go for it. And while you're here, I'm going to give you a prophetic word and prophesy over you. You're going to hear about Jesus while you mow my lawn. Now, I mow my own lawn right now, but I'd love to be in a place one day where I could pay somebody else to do it, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Let's say that this Yeti cup was really filthy inside, and this is your life. When you get born and the Lord dumps out the old, fills this cup with, your, with his spirit, cleans it with the, with the water of his word and his blood, and in a sense, makes it new. Born, this cup's born again, and it's got to measure the Holy Spirit. But now let's take this cup out into the middle of the ocean or a mile offshore and dunk it into the water. Now it's surrounded, filled, and encompassed in every way, shape, and form with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm trying to explain to you a mystery of the kingdom, but I, what I want you to understand is that's the more. The more is a total immersion and an empowerment. If you can't believe that there's more, you've got to see the scripture. The Holy Spirit had already been breathed into the disciples. Pentecost had not come, and he's saying, I want you to wait, which we know by the scriptures, it's 10 more days from this point. Hence, Pentecost, Penta, Greek is 50, Pentecost is 50 days. It's seven weeks plus one day from Passover. So Pentecost, when it comes around every year, we're cel celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is 10 days from this time. And it's an endowment. Understand endowment. It means that God wants to fully immerse you, soak into you, saturate you, so that you take on the full flavor, character, and nature of who he is and walk in this, there's a little word right here you've got to see. It's the word power. When you come into the kingdom, you go from need-based living to faith-based living. Listen to me. When you come into the kingdom, you go from need-based living to faith-based living. You know why? Because faith moves the heart of God not just your need. Does he have compassion on the needy? Yes, he does. But why, why are some nations in poverty and parts of our city in poverty? Why are some people in poverty in the kingdom and others aren't? Because it's faith that moves the heart of God. So when I tell you start believing for a new car, you better listen to what I say. When I tell you you start to believe for increase in your job and increase for God, and, and an increase in your understanding and knowledge and stewardship of how to manage it and be a good leader, listen to me. I have great faith for every single one of you in this sanctuary. You better believe I pray for you. 
I pray for your finances. I pray for your health, your wealth, your well-being, and that you would be made whole. And that's only going to happen through lordship. You don't get around it any other way except through total surrender and trust to the headship of Christ. You got that, right? There's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to be the provider. And the typical lie of go to get the career, get the education so you can provide for your family, that's not the biblical pattern. The biblical pattern is tend and keep God's garden because he already made the garden and put you in it. Recently, in a Tend and Keep Volunteers meeting, everyone went into a deep time of prayer, realigning our hearts to give the Lord more of our time and attention. Over and over again, I was praying, teach us how to pray, God. Teach us how to pray. Now, I've had amazing experiences personally, gathering with people for hours, worshiping, letting the Lord show us new songs to sing, praying out scripture, believing for things to shift in our lives and around us, and getting lost in His presence. The bonds that were formed during those times were incredible. The insights and revelations we received together about God's word and applying it to our lives stuck with me and still anchors me today. But teach us how to pray is what the Lord wanted me to be praying that day. There's always more to learn from him. In the book of Acts, it talks about the early church saying, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And the Lord added to their daily those who were being saved. The early church was in an authentic revival. Let it be the same in our lives, our homes, and our city. When we don't pray, we lose our intimate connection with God because prayer is communication. It's intimacy. It's expression. You can't foster any relationship without communication. The Bible talks about prayer being like incense, rising up to God. It has a beautiful aroma. It's pleasant to Him. It's sweet. God actually receives it from us as a gift. It's the purest thing we can offer Him. I think prayer goes beyond words. Isn't communication also our body language, our attitude, our heart condition? Prayer is the same way. God knows the deepest parts of our hearts. That's why it says in Psalms that deep cries out to deep. He wants to be real with us. He wants our words to be authentic, whether it's praying his promises back to him, asking him for what we need, or simply telling him how beautiful he made the sunset today. When the church leadership started talking about morning, noon, and night prayer once a week, I knew this was substantial, but our hearts had to be all in. Events and plans only go so far. There has to be an understanding of its importance and a dedication to actually show up and do what we know the Lord is asking of us. So come to Incense, 6 a.m., noon, 6 p.m. Wednesdays, and Wednesdays are just to start. Come every time if you like, but come with intention. Come ready to pour out your heart to the Lord. Come ready to learn and grow. The word says to pray without ceasing. So come praying and leave praying. He wants time with us and he wants our whole hearts. See you there. Hey friends, my name's David Bendette, the senior pastor of Rock City Church here in Corpus Christi, Texas. Six years ago, my wife and I made the decision to start Rock City Church in the fellowship hall of another church here in town. In a short amount of time, God opened up the door for us to buy this entire shopping center. Today, our church is out of space, we doubled in size, and we're in a desperate situation where we need to expand, especially in our children's ministry. This shopping center is 40,000 square feet, and we started in the small space right behind me, which used to be a holiday video. And a couple years ago, we ran out of space and made the decision that we were going to expand. And now is the time. We're asking for 300 families to commit to $3,333 in one year, which is an extra $275 a month. And I want to encourage you guys to make the sacrifice and help us to expand and go where God's called us to go. My wife and I have an incredible vision for the city. We named Rock City Church because we're the city built to rock the body of Christ, Texas. And we wanna see this city live up to its namesake. And so I wanna ask you to consider partnering with us. There's several ways that you can give. 
which will be listed on the screen. And please pray and ask the Lord if you're to be a part of the legacy of what's happening in the body of Christ, Texas, as we expand into the next 20,000 square feet that we have next to what you see behind me. So thank you so much for partnering with us. We have an incredible vision. You can follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, at Rock City Corpus, and also keep up with us on our website. <laughs> Almost afternoon. The altar is open. Whoever wants to worship up to the front. My two girls are right here. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning, for today, Lord. For this upcoming week. Jesus, we are excited for what you're doing in our hearts, Lord. God, we are ready to receive your word and your love. God, do whatever you want to do right now, Jesus. Do whatever you want to do. Speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. We give you all the honor and all the glory, Father.
Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart again. Spirit of wisdom, open my eyes again. Spirit of revelation, open my heart. I want to 
Jesus, you're beautiful. You're all that I need. Now you're all that I want. You're all that I'm seeing. Jesus, you're beautiful. You're all that I've needed. Now you're all that I want. And you're all that I'm seeing. Oh, Jesus, you're beautiful. You're all that I've needed. Now you
Just some idea that I have of you. But the real you, I want the real you, I want the real you. Come and be yourself today. Put your feet up. That's what I want, that's what I want, to be with you, to be with you, to be with you. I'm tasting many things and I know I want to be. Be
Let your spirit be all that we see. is your home. We bless you, Jesus, and we thank you for being with us. We pray that every heart is stirred to seek after you in a way that we've never done before. To be with you, to see you, to spend time with you, to seek you out, to understand scripture, to understand your word, to understand your heart. Welcome to Rock City Church, everybody. Pass out some hugs on the way back to your seats. Everybody. My name is David Vendetta. I'm the senior pastor here at Rock City Church in Corpus Christi. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much Here's for what's coming into our live stream. My heart is to see you live in the fullness that God has for you and to be fired up all the days of your life. That comes from intimacy, spending time with the Lord in His Word, and growing in the knowledge and wisdom of who He is. And that's my heartbeat in every message that I preach. I hope you've enjoyed watching some of our worship, and also while you wait, enjoy some of these short past clips from past messages that I've preached. I would encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube page and also like us on Instagram and Facebook and stay fired up and I'll see you in just a moment. Other signs of a poverty mentality, and this is a little convicting, a constant search for the cheapest alternative, an obsession with getting deals and free entry. I've never, if you, if you can only wear name brand and you have to have the most expensive purse, ladies, or the best jeans and shoes all the time, that's a sign of mammon being a God in your life. Now, I like wearing name brand things. Thank God for Marshalls and TJ Maxx. Thank God that Dillard's run sales. That's all I'm saying. But I'm not talking about buying little things or clothes. I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about there's times that God says, you pay full price for that car. You pay full price for that piece of land or that house. Christians are notorious for always trying to get the cheapest bargain free thing. Shouldn't we be the ones that set the standard and the guy comes along and he offers a hard working construction guy or lawn mowing guy or moving guy or whoever it is you are comes along and you don't, you don't have to chintz them down and nickel and dime. You say, how much is oh, 50 bucks to mow my lawn? No problem. Go for it. And while you're here, I'm going to give you a prophetic word and prophesy over you. You're going to hear about Jesus while you mow my lawn. Now, I mow my own lawn right now, but I'd love to be in a place one day where I could pay somebody else to do it, and I don't see anything wrong with that. Let's say that this Yeti cup was really filthy inside, and this is your life. When you get born again, the Lord dumps out the old, fills this cup with, your, with his spirit, cleans it with the, with the water of his word and his blood, and in a sense, makes it new. Born, this cup's born again, and it's got to measure the Holy Spirit. But now let's take this cup out into the middle of the ocean or a mile offshore and dunk it into the water. Now it's surrounded, filled, and encompassed in every way, shape, and form with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm trying to explain to you a mystery of the kingdom, but I, what I want you to understand is that's the more. The more is a total immersion 
and an empowerment. If you can't believe that there's more, you've got to see the scripture. The Holy Spirit had already been breathed into the disciples. Pentecost had not come. And he's saying, I want you to wait, which we know by the scriptures, it's 10 more days from this point. Hence, Pentecost, Penta, Greek is 50. Pentecost is 50 days. It's seven weeks plus one day from Passover. So Pentecost, when it comes around every year, we're celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is 10 days from this time. And it's an endowment. Understand endowment. It means that God wants to fully immerse you, soak into you, saturate you, so that you can take on the full flavor, character, and nature of who he is and walk in. this. There's a little word right here you've got to see. It's the word power. When you come into the kingdom, you go from need-based living to faith-based living. Listen to me. When you come into the kingdom, you go from need-based living to faith-based living. You know why? Because faith moves the heart of God, not just need. Does he have compassion on the needy? Yes, he does. But why, why are some nations in poverty and parts of our city in poverty? Why are some people in poverty in the kingdom and others aren't? Because it's faith that moves the heart of God. So when I tell you start believing for a new car, you better listen to what I say. When I tell you you start believing for an increase in your job, an increase for God, and, and an increase in your understanding and knowledge and stewardship of how to manage it and be a good leader, listen to me. I have great faith for every single one of you in this sanctuary. You better believe I pray for you. I pray for your finances. I pray for your health, your wealth, your well-being, and that you would be made whole. And that's only going to happen through lordship. You don't get around it any other way except through total surrender and trust to the headship of Christ. You got that, right? There's nowhere in the Bible that says you have to be the provider. And the typical lie of go to get the career, get the education so you can provide for your family, that's not the biblical pattern. The biblical pattern is tend and keep God's garden because he already made the garden and put you in it. Recently, in a Tend and Keep Volunteers meeting, everyone went into a deep time of prayer, realigning our hearts to give the Lord more of our time and attention. Over and over again, teach us how to pray, God. Teach us how to pray. Now, I've had amazing experiences personally, gathering with people for hours, worshiping, letting the Lord show us new songs to sing, praying out scripture, believing for things to shift in our lives and around us, and getting lost in His presence. The bonds that were formed during those times were incredible. The insights and revelations we received together about God's word and applying it to our lives stuck with me and still anchors me today. But teach us how to pray is what the Lord wanted me to be praying that day. There's always more to learn from him. In the book of Acts, it talks about the early church saying, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The early church was in an authentic revival. Let it be the same in our lives, our homes, and our city. When we don't pray, we lose our intimate connection with God because prayer is communication. It's intimacy. It's expression. You can't foster any relationship without communication. The Bible talks about prayer being like incense, rising up to God. It has a beautiful aroma. It's pleasant to Him. It's sweet. God actually receives it from us as a gift. It's the purest thing we can offer Him. I think prayer goes beyond words. Isn't communication also our body language, our attitude, our heart condition? Prayer is experience-based faith. You have to have constant, continual experiences and encounters with the Lord. Now, not everyone is a knock you to the ground, shaking, vibrating, weeping, crying, open heaven experience. But sometimes you have to have those. 
the more consistent experiences that you should have in your daily life are hearing God's voice. That's an experience that some people will think you're crazy for, just so that you know. Feeling his presence in worship. Worshiping. Communing with the Lord. Giving your life to Jesus. Weeping, repenting, sitting at his feet. Getting baptized in water. Being baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of experiences. Reading his word and things coming to life for you as you hear God's voice speak to you while you read. There's all kinds of experiences and encounters that we can have and we should have consistently with the Lord. Now, we don't throw out our intellect, but we make our intellect a servant to the Lordship of Christ. God does give us reason and logic and intellect, but it was never designed to lead us and control us or for us to lean on it by itself if we don't have Jesus and the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us at all times, we'll get sideways and we'll start to trust in our own selves instead of trusting in him. We'll use our own reason and logic and wisdom instead of his. And so encounters and experiences are really important, which is why I have Prophet Kevin come and others that come, Jason Lee Jones and Brad McClendon and more people that come that are full of anointing and wisdom and fire and presence and passion and prophecy because I want you to experience the fullness of the kingdom of God and never be stuck in one thing. You know, this church isn't a recovery church. It's not a homeless ministry church. It's not an outreach church. It's not a prophecy church. It's not an evangelism church. It's a holistic church. And what I mean by that is I want us to embrace all the various characteristics and attributes of the Father's heart and what's in the kingdom. And so I'll introduce you to a lot of different things. I'll teach you a lot of different concepts. Because I want people to be able to come here and get exactly what they need and they don't have to go somewhere else. Now, I'm not against other churches. I love them and I'm thankful for the other churches of the city. I've never spoken negative about them and I never would. There's some great churches. There's some incomplete churches. But you know what? We stay in our lane and we do what we're called to do and we want to be able to provide what people need when they come here just like the other churches do. But I think the days of the specialized, specialist church is changing. I think what we need to realize is God wants us to be holistic. It's all the parts encompassing the one, right? So we should move in a whole variety of aspects. We have a large recovery community here. They meet on Monday nights, Troy and Tiffany Walters, a lot of people that have overcome drugs and alcohol and addiction. But that's not everybody. Right. My wife has no grid for my past, like no grid. In fact, she, in her early days, swore she'd never marry a guy like me. I was everything opposite of anything she ever thought she would marry. Prison, married, failures, divorces, drugs, whatever it is that I've been through in my past. She's like, you're the exact guy I'm gonna, my father warned me about to stay away from, right? But, you know, 20-something years after I gave my life to the Lord, I was a changed man. And so God miraculously turned both of our hearts towards each other, and here we are. And so God brings a lot of different people with a lot of different expertises and backgrounds, and not everybody's the same, and that's why we need each other. Last weekend was one of the most powerful weekends I've ever had with the Lord, and I've had a lot of supernatural encounters with God. I've lived in a lot of incredible encounters over 28, 29 years now. And something happened to me on Sunday night that's never happened before. I'm just going to tell you briefly about it. The reason why I'm telling you about it is because I celebrate with you in the encounters and the experiences you have, and I think it's important that you know about the ones I have. And for me as a pastor, I think it's very important that you know I'm as desperate, hungry, thirsty, broken, and desirous of encounters as I think you should be. And I'm willing to be the forerunner and the pioneer, even if it looks crazy, because it was pretty crazy. I mean, let's, let me just tell you how crazy it was Sunday night. For the first time, maybe ever, I could not talk. Now I'm telling you, you know it's the Lord. Even my wife said, oh man, it, it was definitely Jesus. You were speechless. I'm like, yeah, that's right. And so on Sunday night, it was a culmination of a whole weekend of phenomenal services. Now, if you weren't here for the weekend services with Prophet Kevin, what I want you to know is that if you're a part of this church, you get the benefits that everybody else gets. And don't feel like you lost out and missed out. I get it. There's all kinds of reasons why you maybe couldn't have make, made it. 
You can watch the services online. I'm getting a little of that feedback sound again. You can watch the services online. It doesn't do it justice if you were not here, um, but you can still see what happened. But on Sunday night, I can give you a little bit of a snapshot if you'd like to know. Would you guys like to know? Yeah. All right. So Sunday night, I was up on the stage, and Kevin came up as at the end of worship, and he called for those that have been in gangs and drugs and prostitutes and those that have really been through incredibly difficult lifestyles, and even those that were single parents and those that were just desperate for the Lord to come up and grab the mic and shout in the mic, God, make me holy. And so as he, they were shouting, God, make me holy, you could feel the presence of God come into the sanctuary in such a powerful way. One of the themes for this last weekend was the fear of God and holiness. And so people started crying out to the Lord, and they started weeping, and it was incredible. People started shaking. And next thing you know, people start weeping in the sanctuary. And I was up on the back, and I turned around, and I faced the wall. And I, as I started, can you fix that ring, Levi? It's, it's bothering me. And so I turned around, I started facing the wall, and as I started facing the wall, I heard the Lord say, start to agree and pray with me for extravagant things that are so big that you didn't think could be possible. So that's what he said to me. And so the first thing that came to my mind was my dad. Now, if you don't know the story of my dad, I've shared it before, but basically my dad is a very wealthy person very known, very famous in Beverly Hills, California. We have the same name, by the way. And he left my mother and I when I was one. And so I only met him one time in my life when I was 27 years old. I have a half-brother and half-sister that I've never met. And that was a short encounter. It wasn't very fruitful. I learned a few things about him, but there was no relationship that was maintained since that time. That was when I was 28 years old. Today, he's 78 or 79 years old. And lately, over this last season, the Lord has been speaking to me a lot about my dad and the restoration of my relationship with my dad. And so that's what I started praying for, and I start weeping. I got real emotional. See, I've forgiven my dad, but I've never really prayed for him. Like, I prayed for him, but not really cried out for him. It's, it's hard for me to explain it to you. But I found myself really crying out and interceding and praying for him. And my prayer was that God would restore the relationship before he passes away. And I'd like to ask all of you to agree with that with me. Would you guys pray for that with me? It's a very important thing to me, right? No matter what, I don't want anything from him. But just to see him and know him and have a restoration with him before he dies is important for me, right? So I start praying for him. I start weeping. And then Kevin says, I hear the Lord say, start praying for something really extravagant that could never be possible in your own way. Pray for the miraculous. He said exactly what God had just said to me. So next thing I know, I start praying for all these people that have been in my life. These, these men that have been fathers or mentors, more wealthy guys that since the day I got born again, every stage of my life and every season, God has brought a new one into my life. But they would leave. There's all these men that have been in my life as fathers that I was close to that suddenly just left. And the relationship when there, and it's not like a rift happened or I did something, they just disengaged. Have any of you ever had that happen to you? And my heart started breaking for these, these men, and I start crying out and praying for them. Start, and I'm weeping, and I hit the deck up here on the altar, and I start crying, and people are weeping and wailing, and I'm hearing men start crying out for their spouses, and it was, man, it was just incredible and there was people were just crying out to the lord in a way that's never happened in this church to that degree it was really really incredible so after about 30 minutes kevin calls me down he says let's transition when i got here to the podium and i got the mic i couldn't talk i was weepy and a lot of people were weeping in the sanctuary and i found myself just like trembling on the inside and kevin says shout holy into the mic so I shouted holy into the mic, and as soon as I did, I felt like a thousand volts of electricity shot right through my body, and it took me right to the ground. And when I hit the ground, I don't know how to explain it to you, except I was in full-scale terror of the fear of the Lord, with no, and I wasn't scared. It's hard for me to explain that to you, but it was like God stepped into this house, like in a way I'd never felt before. 
And at the same time, I felt like I had no gravity, like I was weightless. And so I'm gripping onto the ground and the table like I felt like I was just going to float off through the universe is what I felt like. From that point forward, I don't remember much of anything else that happened. I was gripped by God. And apparently, the men came around me and they sang and they cried out. And I had no idea, but apparently we have a, the picture, in case you didn't see it, pull that picture up. There I am on the floor, and I am being just rocked by the Lord. And then go to the next one. All the over 100 men came and gathered around me and were singing. I just want to say right now, thank you to the men for doing that. I didn't really know you were doing that at the time. But looking back at this picture, I was, it was a marked moment for my entire life. And so you may think, well, what happened to you? Well, I don't really know what happened to me. That's the thing. What I do know is God was doing something inside of me. I shared it with Brad McClendon. You can take it down now. I shared it with Brad McClendon, and he said, God's preparing you for what's about to come. And God was marking me for and preparing me and preparing us as a church for what was about, what's about to happen in this church. And I just want to say to you guys that I really feel like we're about to experience an incredible healing movement at this church. People that are sick with uncurable diseases and mental illness and all kinds of ailments in their body and their mind, I really genuinely believe that this church is about to experience a healing movement of God where we see very real, tangible healings take place in this house. So prepare yourself. I feel like the Lord told me that's about to come. And that's what, what was um, happening to me that night. Some of you may remember a dream I had about three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, right after the turn of the uh, new year after the conference, I heard the Lord say, Emma and Jara, Emma and Jara, cataclysmic collision, cataclysmic collision, heaven is invading earth. And I woke up. So I'm just telling you, I've got some insight into that, but there's a cataclysmic collision that's about to happen and God's going to have you right in the center of it if you want it. All right. It's not for me, just for me. It's for us and for this church. You just got to be hungry and want it. So I just wanted to share that with you because it really marked my life. And so many people walked out of here after this weekend changed. It was really, really, really incredible. And thank you to everybody that testified on Wednesday night. I heard it was awesome. It was just a fantastic time. And so I love you all so much. I love this church and I'm thankful for you guys and the way that you worship and are so hungry for the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this time that we have to be together, and thank you, God, for giving us the right word in the right season. I thank you that every heart is open, every ear is open to hear and receive what it is you want to say and do in their lives and in this church. I thank you, Lord God, for showing up in the worship, showing up in the word, and challenging us in how we live after we walk out of here. I thank you, Lord God, that we know that you're here, and we know that you want to come even stronger into our lives and that you're preparing us for what lies ahead. And I pray every single person that is a part of this church would have daily experiences and encounters with you, that they would hear your voice, they would have supernatural touches of your presence, but most importantly, that they would know you for who you are. May we know your ways and may every encounter and every act, every touch lead us to know you more intimately for who you really are. And I thank you for this time that we have to be together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So a couple of weeks ago, I preached on Luke 18. And I talked about the parable that Jesus told with the Pharisee, the religious leader, and the tax collector. Some of you might remember that. The name of that message was pride and humility. Pride and humility. Because really, that's what the parable's about. It's about this uh, religious leader that comes into the temple and starts thanking God for how religious and righteous and upright he is. And ultimately wanting to be justified and exalted by the Lord. And then you have this miserable, scum of the earth tax collector that all the religious leaders hate. And he hates all the religious leaders. So you have this great divide and expanse between two people that come into the church to pray. One's beating his chest, crying out for mercy. And staying far away from the altar and the religious leader because he feels so unworthy. And then you have the religious leader that's basically full of pride, exalting himself and thanking God that he's not like the other guy. And I talked a lot about that and I broke that scripture down in depth. 
And the reason why I taught you that and why I'm going to teach you what I'm teaching you today is for this reason. Rock City Church is called to reach the most hurting, broken, darkest places of our city. We're called to reach those that could be living on the island and have a lot of money, but living in darkness, addiction, deception, and depression. Those from the south side to the west side, from the island to Sinton. Those that are living in all different types of walks of life, socioeconomic status, those that have money and those that don't have money. The black, the white, the Asian, the Mexican, the Hispanic, any race, any color, any whatever it is that's in their life, we're called to reach them. But very hurting and broken people are going to be coming to this church. Many of you were once those people. And as you get healthy and as you get strong, if you don't have a right understanding of how to treat other people and a right understanding of what you're becoming, you'll find yourself living with pride and looking down on other people so subtly you won't realize it, but God hates it. And that's why I taught that. I also taught it because I want you to be able to come in here, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter how much you failed, no matter where you were last night, no matter what you've been doing or haven't been doing, and be able to worship the Lord and cry out for mercy and never feel like somebody's going to look down on you or have disdain for you or feel like you can't approach the altar or get around me or around a leader. Because that's what shame does. Shame separates you, shame isolates you, and it makes you to feel like you're not worthy and you're not good enough. And on the flip side, as you get stronger and you get healthy, you can get this superiority complex where you feel like you're the super spiritual self-righteous one and they're not. And that's never how Jesus was, ever. And if we're going to really become who we're called to become, not just as a church, but individually, then we have to be able to love people and reach people right where they're at, no matter what God's done or changed in your life. And to really help you understand this, I'm going to read a scripture to you from Galatians chapter 6. We're going to read the first five verses from the Passion Translation, and then we're going to bounce off of there, all right? You guys ready? Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 from the Passion Passion Translation. My beloved friends, if you see a believer who's overtaken with a fault, may the one who overflows with the Spirit seek to restore him. Win him over with gentle words which will open his heart to you and will keep you from exalting yourself over him. Love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's troubles. If you think you're too important to stoop down and help another, you're living in deception. Let everyone be devoted to fulfill the work God has given them to do with excellence. And their joy will be in doing what's right and being themselves, not in being affirmed by others. Every believer is ultimately responsible for his or her own conscience. <laughs> Woo! That is a powerful block of scriptures I'm going to break down for you this morning. First, let's go back to, the, to verse 1. People are constantly being overtaken. Faults, failures, shortcomings, inadequacies, sin, lack of self-confidence, shame, self-esteem issues, all kinds of things can overtake us. We all have to battle them. We all have to renew our minds daily. We all have to have to pay the same price to get what God has for each and every one of us. Nobody gets to bypass the process. No one does. I have to pay the price as much as you do. The enemy always wants to overtake me. And he always wants to overtake you. And he does all he can to keep you bound up in your faults and in your shame and your inadequacies. And the last thing that should happen is that when you carry it into the church house, that somebody only magnifies it and beats you up and makes you feel less than instead of restoring you in a spirit of gentleness and pulling you up and out of it. Right? That's why we've got to build a culture of love, unity, and humility. We have to. And so... We live our lives with this mindset that there's two groups of people. There are those that are not spiritual and those that are spiritual. But to take the title of spiritual, you have to be extremely careful. And you have to always make sure what makes you spiritual is not your own self-righteousness and how good you've been, but rather the Holy Spirit inside of your life leading, guiding, and directing you. 
So I'm going to say this. I've said it many times. Say it again. Here's what I believe the highest form of Christian maturity is. It's not whether you sinned or not. It's not whether you were good or bad. The highest form of Christian maturity isn't how much you read your Bible and worshiped and prayed. The highest form of Christian maturity is that you're led by the Holy Spirit at all times. Because rooted inside the nature and character of the Holy Spirit is love, patience, kindness, temperance, meekness, gentleness, faith. All those are rooted inside of the fruit of the Spirit. And you have to remember, gifts are given, but fruit is grown. So you have to grow fruit in your life. It's not like I get this whole instant deposit of understanding. Do I get the fullness of Jesus when you get born again? Do you? Yes. So you have all of him now. But now you have to learn to cultivate and grow fruit with him over the course of time. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, if you will submit and you will listen and you will follow and be led, you will become spiritual. The, the New King James Version in actually that verse 1 says, let those or us who are spiritual. The word is pneumaticos. Pneuma is wind, breath, or spirit. Matikos is to be driven or led by the Holy Spirit. It's wind driven in every area of your life. When you're wind driven and spirit led at all times, guess what? You will love people well. You'll love your spouse well. You'll love your coworkers well. You'll love yourself well because you're constantly hearing the truth instead of a lie. You know how you, the, the greatest defining factor of somebody that is spiritual is that they don't have envy, strife, and division in their life. It's one of the greatest ways to measure somebody's life. Full of envy, strife, division, everything opposite of the fruit of the Spirit inside of their lives. But it's our job as we grow and get healthy and strong to do what? To restore them. You know, the, 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 the concept of restoring somebody in the, in the New Testament, actually throughout all scriptures, but in the New Testament, the Hebraic understanding of restoring somebody is this. I'm going to mend your nets and I'm going to repair the factions and divisions in your life. What were the disciples doing when Jesus walked up to them on the Sea of Galilee? Mending their nets, right? So Jesus comes and really mends their nets spiritually. They were mending their nets in the natural, but they needed their spiritual nets mended. And so when Jesus comes into our lives, what's he do? He puts us back together. Mending our nets is a couple of concepts. It's I get unified with you. Let's mend nets. We were divided. Let's mend nets. But it's also everything that's caused you to not be successful and fruitful in your life gets restored. Now you don't bounce from job to job, lover to lover, drug to drug, thing to thing, church to church. Now we get into relationship and family and your nets get mended. You get healthy. Get it? So our job is to get healthy. Now, if you're not healthy today, you're depressed, hurting, addicted, uh, struggling with lust, porn, alcohol, drugs, feeling far from God. The good news is there's a lot of spiritual people here. I'm not the only one. There's a family and an army of spiritual people that can grab you by the hand and pull you up and out. You see, we have to move away from the concepts of a hand out ministry. It has to be a hand up, which means you got to be willing to take the hand up. You got to lay down your own pride. You got to lay down your own fears. I get it. Some of you've got church hurts. Some of us are afraid to let people know what's really going on in our lives. And you got to step into the light. You got to let shame be broken off of you. This is a shame breaking house. I see people every Sunday, every Sunday. Come up, say hi to me. And I already know just by looking at them, they had a rough night. They were out way late and in all the wrong places doing what they shouldn't have been doing. People are full of shame, struggling. And they come to me all the time. You know how I look at them? Not with what's the matter with you. You should have known better. Why are you doing it? You put yourself in this spot. No. Notice what the scripture says. Go back to verse 1. It says, we are, who are spiritual are to restore them. Go to the next verse. How? With gentle words. 
We're to restore them with kindness, meekness, because that's the way Jesus is. We're to be like Jesus. You've got to catch what I'm teaching you today because the church is full of spiritual pride and arrogance and it's a disdain and it's causing more people to run to atheism and leave the church than anything else. It's people in the name of God pretending with hypocrisy to be something that they're not and snubbing their nose and looking down at somebody else instead of being like Jesus and getting your hands and knees and feet dirty and getting down on the ground and washing other people's feet and hooking your yoke up to them. So we're called to restore people. And we're called to be spiritual. You know another great word for spiritual, other than wind-driven and spirit-led? It's this word regenerate. Different than degenerate. Okay, you know what regenerate means? To be regenerate or regenerated means that I'm not the man I once was now. It means I'm not carnally minded anymore. That's a great word for spiritual. Spiritual. It's the opposite of carnal. You should know what carnal is. Carnal is where we get the word flesh, and it's where we get the word like meat eater, carnivore, carnival. It's everything opposite of spiritual. It's enmity or hatred towards God. So to be spiritual means that I'm not living for myself, my own pleasures, my own desires. It means I'm not living in self-righteousness, but I'm following the Holy Spirit, and I recognize I'm nothing without him, but with him I'm everything. It means that now I'm not living in carnal hypocrisy so that when you need a hand up, I can say I was once there, you can come out. Part of the reason why we have such a large recovery community and more that are come. Opioid addictions and drug addictions and alcoholism and people numbed out and checked out from human trafficking to drug dealers and to the pimps. They're everywhere around. But that's not all this church is reaching because there's a lot of people that don't have that same testimony that I do. Like my wife. She has never done one drug ever. Never, ever even took a toke off a joint. (laughs) I tell my stories and she looks at me like, I have zero, I have no concept of what you're saying. But she reaches a very unique group of people as well. Just like each of you do. The main thing here is that you don't fall into the comparison trap. And that's what we're going to really talk about today. We're going to really hit the comparison trap. Because actually, we're going to flop back and forth. I really love this version, but I love the New King James. Jump over to verse 1 in the New King James. Well, you can't do that in your Bible, but we can do it on the screen. If a man's overtaken with a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore one with the spirit of gentleness. Watch this next part. Uh, lest, or consider yourself, lest you also be tempted. I'm going to teach you something so fantastic today. I always used to read this scripture different than its original intent. Here's how I would read this scripture. Now, there's some truth to what I'm about to say to you. Because the question is always, who's influencing who? See, after I got born again, I went right back to Miami. After I got out of jail, I went back to Miami. And the only friends I had were my old Grateful Dead party friends. And they were really great friends in the sense of they loved me. They weren't friends, spiritual friends, but they cared a lot about me. And I had walked through life with them. So when I got born again, I had this mentality that I was going to go back and save them. I was like, Moses, I'm going to go let my people go. <laughs> but, we, but I didn't read the part that Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years before he went back. Right? And so I thought right away I was going to go right back. So I go hang out with these guys, and they're smoking, toking, snorting. They're doing all the drugs that they do, and I'm hanging out with them, and I'm not, I have a conviction, and they're like, it's okay, brother. It's okay. We all have forgiveness. And then I was like, okay, yeah, I guess you're right. And I was born again, spirit-filled. Who was influencing who? But you see, that's not actually what the scripture is referring to, though there's some truth to that. If you're going to restore somebody, take heed to yourself so that you don't find yourself in that temptation is how I always read that. Is there truth to that? That's not what the scripture is referring to. You know what the scripture is referring to? Spiritual pride. That when I'm coming to restore you, I need to take heed to myself 
and examine myself so that I don't look down on you and so that I'm not tempted to think myself better than something I am. You know how I know that? Look at the next verse. We're called to bear one of the next verse. I titled this message, Somethings and Nothings. If anybody thinks there's something when they're nothing, you're deceived. The, the passion says if you, are, if you think of yourself too good and too big and too better that you can't stoop down and help somebody else, you're deceived. And spiritual pride is the temptation. How do I know that? Luke 18. Two people go to the temple to pray. What should the, the, Pharisee, should have, what should the Pharisee have been doing? How can I restore, love, serve, and help this person? Instead, he was praying, thank God I'm not like him. It's so subtle and it's such a disdain. I'm giving language to you for the issues and the problems in the modern Western Americanized church. It's spiritual pride and the temptation to think that I'm better than you and I look down on you instead of serving you and coming underneath you to bear you up and to lift you out. Because it started out with, we who are spiritual should bear the burdens of those that are not. Right? Because there's two dynamics. The one dynamic is the inferiority complex. How many of you know what an inferiority complex is? Well, just in case you don't, I'm going to read it to you. An inferiority complex consists of feelings of not measuring up to standards. Is there anybody here that's constantly living in a world of I'm not measuring up? It's a doubt and uncertainty about yourself. It's a lack of self-esteem. And it's often subconscious and is thought to drive afflicted individuals to overcompensate, resulting either in spectacular achievement or extremely asocial behavior. Now, that was me. I know some of you might think, how could I have ever had an inferiority complex? I had one my whole life. And I actually have had to really crucify that thing to be where I'm at today. Here's how I had it. My blood father left me when I was one. My mom was a single mom who worked two jobs and left me at the babysitter all day. I was abandoned, neglected, and robbed in my childhood with no dad. And so in turn, I would overcompensate. How? By being driven to succeed. You're going to know my name. I'm going to prove you wrong. You know, it's the thunder and lightning song all over again. You once didn't want to know me, but now you're in the nosebleed section worshiping me, basically. And it's this mindset that now that I was neglected and abandoned, I needed to perform. I needed to measure up, and I would overcompensate to please people. The man-pleasing spirit is brutal. And self-esteem, instead of being yourself and who God called you to be and growing up and out of it, we stay stuck in it and we always look at everybody else as better than us. It produces major social anxiety, major social anxiety. But what's the opposite of inferiority complex? A superiority complex. And it's just as bad. In fact, it's worse. I hate the superiority complex, don't you? I have a real disdain for it, and so does God. If anybody thinks that there's something when they're nothing, they deceive themselves. I'm nothing without him. Let's say it together. I'm nothing without him. I can do nothing without him. It's this understanding that you can't let self-pride, self-righteousness, and over arrogance and confidence. God, does God want you to be confident? Sure he does. But confident in his ability in you and the ability that he's given me. And so what's happening here in this, this teaching is that God is showing you don't fall prey to two things. One, the fact that you don't need restoration and that, that nobody can help you. That's a lie. Or I only need Jesus and I don't need people. That's a lie too. 
because it says we're spiritual should restore. You know, here's a great way for me to show it. I'm going to just jump forward to Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Here's a phenomenal way for me to explain this to you. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weak, weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Why? Because his yo- he's lowly and meek and his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus is lowly and he's meek. You know what that means? He takes the low road. Not pride and arrogance, but humility and service. He looks at people not with eyes of disdain, but eyes of love. So, so do people need to go to Jesus to get rest? And go to the next verse. Do, G, do people need to take Jesus' yoke upon them and learn from him? Is he gentle and low in heart? Yes. Look at the next verse. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. You know what that scripture means? It means that Jesus will meet you right where you're at. Because the deceptive lie is I'm so bad, I'm not good enough, I'm so jacked up, my marriage is jacked up, I haven't been reading my Bible, I've been doing this, I'm, whatever it is, whatever your issues are, whatever the stuff is, the mindset is I'm too bad, I'm too gone, I'm too far, or I've been doing too much that Jesus can't hook up to me. But the reality is the darker and the harder it is and the more jacked up you are, the greater ability you are in and in a spot to get hooked up to his yoke. So he's basically saying that I'm, I am strong, you're weak, now hook up to my strength and I'll pull you out. That's the concept of the scripture. Now he says for you to do that to other people. He doesn't give you a pass. He says be like me. Because now the scripture in Galatians 6 you who are spiritual, hook up with an easy yoke and a light burden and gentleness and take, get low and pull them out. Spiritual pride and arrogance is a disdain to God. Self-righteousness and the Pharisee, the Pharisee was not justified, but the sinner who walked in begging and crying and beating his chest and weeping and confessing his sin was justified in God's presence. We can't allow ourselves to be driven by selfishness or consumed by our own worlds of hurt and pain. We all are in a desperate state of need and we realize that what we really need is somebody more spiritual to bring restoration to my life. I am confident that I'm spiritual, but I also realize I'm nothing and I didn't earn it or deserve it and I'm not good enough to have gotten there and the only thing making me spiritual is not my position, my title or even how disciplined I am. It's the Holy Spirit and Jesus in me leading and guiding and the fact that I'm listening, watching and my ears are tuned towards him and I'm staying in my lane to live with excellence and I'm being myself. So hence, I don't have to worry about whether you like me or not and you don't have to worry about if somebody else likes you because the news flashes, somebody's not going to like you. They're going to not like you. They're going to think you're crazy. And the more spiritual you get, mark my words, the more persecution is going to come against your life. That's how it works. And the persecution actually refines you because it kills you. It kills all that fear of that man-pleasing thing inside of you. Just get radical, get on fire, and be like Jesus and do what Jesus did no matter what your friends or your family or your colleagues or your coworkers say. You can do it. We don't live with a one down mindset like I'm the guy, I'm the man and you're my pet, you're my peasant servant and I was once where you're at. But if, but if you do all these things and yeah, I'll give you a hand out, but not a hand up and I'll actually just write the check and maybe serve in the food kitchen, but I won't get in the trenches with you and get dirty. Now, I'm thankful for people that write checks and serve at soup soup kitchens. But God calls us to do more than that. Because some people will write the check or serve in the food line or even serve at church and hide behind their positions of service because they don't actually want to get dirty and get yoked up and get in the trenches with somebody else's issues. You know, I'm teaching this church this for a reason. Because we're building a culture and an army of a family. And a lot of people are going to be walking through those doors. You mark my words. 
And if we it, things don't go wrong, they start wrong. So we're starting this right. I'll take a long, slow, steady growth like a mighty oak tree than an overnight explosion. And I'm an overnight explosion kind of guy. Really. That's why we're on this long, steady, consistent path of growth so that we're resilient, we're stalwarts, and nothing will shake us. Because if we don't get this thing I'm teaching you today, what will happen? We're going to fracture. You know how you know when somebody's spiritual? They're not carnal. You know how you know when somebody's spiritual? No envy, strife, or division. No, no, I'm the man, you're not. I have the title, you don't. Instead, how can I wash your feet? Now, I'm, I'm just one guy. Trust me, I have lived this and I still live it. I can't live it with all of you. So I have to have guys like Jeremy, Colton, women like Lauren, Morgan, all, the, all you ladies, all the men. We have to work together as a team so that I can do the handoff because I'm not good at everything. Neither are you. Does anybody hear me this morning? Yeah. You guys all right? Yeah. You got you to learn to do the handoff. We got hands, eyes, ears, mouths, feet, knees, elbows. So when somebody comes up to Amber and they've been strung out on drugs and they're desperate for prayer and she's the pastor's wife and they think just because she's the pastor's wife, she has all the answers. So they come up to Amber after service and say, I've been strung out for four days on meth. Will you pray for me? She says, I don't mind praying for you, but let me point you to somebody that I know really understands and can help you with what you need. And you find what you're good at. You find what you're anointed at. And you partner up with those that are, can be strong where you're weak. It's called a body. And not one body part is, we, is even, even though it may seem like the least, you know what God says about the least body part? I don't know what the least body part is in a body. I would suspect it's a pinky toe. I don't know for sure if it's a pinky toe. I don't know. But you know what God says about the pinky toe? It's actually the most important. I'm like, no, my eyes are more important than my pinky toe. It goes, no, no, no. From a spiritual standpoint, Every part is equal and the weakest affects everything. When we love the broken and the outcast like Jesus loved, it opens the hearts of the hurting and puts an easy and light yoke upon them versus putting shame and condemnation on them. Right? So notice in the Passion Translation, it said that if we'll love them with gentleness and restore them, what will it do? It'll open their heart to you. Now you have an in versus I'm here, you're here, and I'm looking down upon you. You guys get it? Okay. Let's talk for a moment about the law of Christ and fulfilling the law of Christ. If you go back to verse two, it says love empowers us to fulfill the law of the anointed one as we carry each other's trouble or burdens. I love that. The law of Christ deals directly with how we love and treat others. And this love carries and bears the weights, weaknesses, and burdens of others. Now, if you have a disdain for people, the outcast, the drug addict, the broken, the hurting, the lowly. We had a guy walk up after service last service who's living in the Salvation Army. You can tell he's had a rough past. It was his first time here today. And he came up to me and I could tell, like, okay, he's, he's in a pretty rough spot. And I just preached this message. It was as if the minute I preached the message, God said, now here comes the test. Because the first thoughts, man, this person is crazy. Man, what have they done? I, I didn't think that way, but you could go that direction. And instead, I let him talk and he... You know, he had something he wanted me to print and read and give to y'all. And he was like ready to conquer the world. And he was so flamed on excited. And I, I just affirmed him, loved him in gentleness. And then I gave him a big hug and I prayed for him. And my hope and my prayer is that he'll be able to find hope and strength and re restoration here or somewhere with Jesus. And then while I'm talking to him, God says, this is the very ones that God I'm going to be bringing into your life. So prepare yourself. Instead of looking down on him. And so. 
The law of Christ is you, the world will know we're Jesus' disciples. How? By our love. Love others as I have loved you. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor likewise. It, it has to be both. So we can't live isolated, nice, suburbia Christian lifestyles. It would be, I'm, I think I would be in the easiest position to do that. I have successful coffee shops that make money. I live on some land on the outskirts of town, and it actually has like a white farm fence in the front. But I would die if it was unto ourselves, and so would you. This is you get success and God blesses you and you start to move up. Never lose sight of where you came from. Never look down with disdain on anybody. And for those of you that have an inferiority complex, let's break out of the pity party and the victim mentality and cry out for help and not be afraid to get in relationship. Because God measures us in the context of our relationships. Meaning like the good definition of how spiritual we are is how well we do relationships with other people. Because if I treat people like crap, if I'm angry, nasty, mean, rude, go look at my staff. Go look at the coffee shops. Inspect the fruit in the people that are leaders here in the church. Do they feel empowered and loved and strengthened or is there crazy weird strife and division and I'm surrounded by bodyguards and you can't talk to me or touch me? No. It's unity, love, strength, encouragement, restoration. Let's go back to verse 3, Galatians 6, 3. If anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So I live in this constant mindset of not thinking that I'm something. If anybody thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. You got to live a life of taking heed, especially men. I know women do too. I talked about this recently. But there's an onslaught against biblical manhood. The, the perverse sexual society that we live in, pornography, it is a full, and especially if you're single or you have strife in your marriage, the temptations, pornography, lust, the commercials, the TV shows, the movies. And I simply like, man, pastor, you're being so spiritual. I said, yeah, I want to be wind driven. I don't want to watch something Christ died for. And I understand how much the enemy wants to trip you up and me up. And I got to stay aggressive and in the fight. Because marriages are ending up in divorce, people aren't loving right, broken homes, broken children, fatherless families, people feeling like there's something when they're not. And it's like, you know what, I'm going to take the low road. And I want to say to you, please don't put that inferior or superiority complex on me or somebody else. I, you want to have people to look up to. But the challenge is, is, is the inferiority complex puts you in a man-pleasing spirit and causes you to be pretentious and not be yourself. And I, I want you to be yourself. And so with that, I'm going to close with verses 4. Let's go back to the Passion Translation. I want you to look at these last two verses because they are incredible. Let everyone be devoted to fulfill the work God has given them to do with excellence. Be diligent to do what God's called you to do. And you're going to find joy when you do the right thing. But most importantly, when you be yourself. You know what I want you to do? I want you to be yourself. I get it. But the last thing I want you to do is put on your best Christian front and wear your best face and pretend and try to be something that you're not. Right. You'll find joy in doing it. Who wants to live their whole life as a Christian? Miserable. Anybody? We have such warped perceptions about God, church, religion. Be yourself. Jesus does what Jesus does best. My mindset's not to fix you, it's to restore you. It's to bring you back to your original intent of what God designed you to be. And for you to learn to find affirmation, comfort, exhortation, encouragement from Jesus. You know why that's so important? I'll self-deprecate on myself. My wife is not an encourager very well. It's like last on her list. I'm over the top encourager, if you can't tell. 
I exhort, I encourage my wife. She's like, what's the matter with you? You're sick again? What did you do this time? No, I'm, I'm not painting her in a bad light. She has had to grow and learn to be an encourager and speak my language. And I've had to learn to speak hers. She's not a high feeler. She's not oversensitive. She's structured, organized, list, planner, get the job done, heavy thinker, judger. It's just her personality and God, how God's wired her. That's why God put us together. But I had to get over whether somebody texts me or puts something on Facebook of how great the message was or wasn't. I had to get over whether somebody affirmed me or not. You know how you get over it? I learned to do what's right and find my joy in being a son and get my encouragement from him when I never get it from you. This is the hardest part for singles. Because you're longing for a spouse or somebody in your life to help you and comfort you. Let me just tell you, make Jesus your first love because your spouse will never give you all that you need. Only Jesus does. So I learned to find affirmation and comfort and encouragement. Not, look at the scripture. I learned to be myself, not a man pleaser. And if you've been a man pleaser, you got to break that thing. If you've had a uh, self-esteem issue, if you've had an inferiority complex, let's break that thing. You know, it comes from bad fathering, bad churches, bad experiences. Maybe you were bullied. Maybe you didn't have a dad. Maybe people did you wrong. A spouse cheated you. A girlfriend, a lover, a best friend did you wrong. Whatever it is, when you come to the place of restoration, you can learn to do what's right and you'll find joy in it. And then you'll be yourself. And then you won't find yourself worrying if I get the affirmation from somebody else. Should we affirm people? But should we live for the affirmation of others? So I want to ask you all to stand and I want to ask the prayer partners and the ministry team to come up. Why don't you just close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment. This is where the Lord begins to speak to you about what you just heard. Take a few minutes before we go today. One of the greatest revelations I ever got was when I realized I was robbed of my childhood. That I didn't have the affirmation and the love of the Father, the Heavenly Father, the moral guidance and direction that I needed. And then as a broken person, I exalted and put godly people or what I thought godly were godly on a pedestal then when they failed me it only fueled my hurt and pain from my dad if that's you I hear the Lord saying that's a lot of you here this morning I want you to come up and let somebody pray for you if you have been living in a victim mentality and just constantly feel like you're not good enough for measuring up that God's angry or you're living in this constant world of failure, we're here to restore you today. I want to invite you to come up. If this message spoke to you this morning, I want to invite you to come up and let somebody stand with you. Don't take it home. Don't take it home. And I also want, to want you to come up if you are, have been thinking yourself to be something when you're nothing. That's probably the hardest thing to admit is spiritual pride. If you've been full of pride, spiritual pride and arrogance and looking down on people instead of stooping down to help them, come on up and let somebody pray for you today. You got to repent of those things. You got to repent. Change the way you think. Change the way you act. Change the way you live by being like Jesus. And if you need somebody to hook up to you today and pull you up and out of the struggles, the hurts, the pains, the sickness, the mental anguish, 
I want to invite you to come and let somebody pray for you. You can also kneel down at the altar today and just have a moment with Jesus. We're ending early, so I'd ask you to take conversations to the lobby. And you're welcome to sit as Jordan plays and come up and let somebody pray for you. And now I'm going to pray for you corporately. Jesus, I thank you so much that this is a culture of love and unity and honor. Break the man-pleasing spirit right out of this place and the religious spirit that would cause us to look down on people with disdain, cause us to trust in our own righteousness, to be self-righteousness or full of pride. And as we grow, Lord, I pray you'd break any pride out of us and cause us to love like you loved. And I pray anybody here that's battling with hurts, pains, addictions, and brokenness in their home and their heart, that, Lord, they would find somebody spiritual to restore them. Bring the spiritual restorers to this house and cause people to open themselves up, Lord, to be free and to get help. Thank you, God, for strong marriages, strong children. Thank you, Lord God, for great love and passion. And thank you, Jesus, for causing us to know you and hear you and to be led by you and to stoop down and pull people up and out and bring them to where we're at. I love you and I thank you, God, for this church. And I thank you for an awesome day, an awesome new season, and for people that love and live the way that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you all so much. Wednesday night, worship and communion. Come on up if you'd like prayer. Feel free to kneel at the front. Have an awesome day.